thanks again, everyone, for your patience there. I wanted, would like to welcome you to the September SPRC seminar series. Uh, and today's uh, topic is Aboriginal Cultural Governance of Health Research. There will be four presenters today, and I'll just um, very quickly uh, say each of their names and, and where they're from, um, and then I'll pass it over to them so there's more time for their presentation and discussion. Um, before we get going, I would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal people that are the traditional custodians of on the land where UNSW Sydney stands, Randwick campus. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. And I know that people are joining us from all over the country. So if you'd like to um, add in your own acknowledgement of country to the chat box, please feel welcome to do that. It's always nice to see where everyone has come from. So first, um, the first presenter today, let's find a few different slides on my computer here. Um, is Ted Fields Jr. He is the Director of Yura Innovations and Cultural Services, ULRWE and Gummelroy Language Teaching Programs. Dr. Ariati Yeshadadna is a research fellow at the Center for Primary Healthcare and Equity and the School of Population Health and a visiting fellow at the School of Social Sciences, UNSW Sydney. Assistant Professor Stephanie Topp is an assistant professor in global health and development in the College of Public Health, Medical and Veterinary Sciences at James Cook University, an associate research fellow at the Nussel Institute for Global Health, University of Melbourne. And lastly, Wendy Jobson is an Aboriginal researcher and scientist scholar at the Social Policy Research Sydney, sorry, Research Centre, UNSW Sydney. Uh, thanks very much, and I will pass it over to you. And so just to quickly touch base, there, there'll be about 45 minute presentation and then followed by 15 minutes of discussion that will be facilitated by the presenters. And if everyone can stay on mute or add comments if needed, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Can everyone see the screen there, the first slide? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Ari Yashadama. I'm a non-Aboriginal person of Southeast Asian descent. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people where I'm presenting from today, as well as the Yilaroi, Gamaroi, and Yuan peoples who I work closely with every day, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here in the seminar. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that we all live and work on unceded Aboriginal land uh, and that the struggle for land rights and cultural continuity does continue. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just a bit of background on why we do this work and why cultural governance is important. So culture and its practice and maintenance are central to the health and well-being of Aboriginal Australians, including its role in health research. There's much evidence that links a lack of cultural governance and, and control of Aboriginal research to poor translations of research findings or social health and change. Um, there's much literature that is published on this. Um, approaches like these exclude Aboriginal cultural ways of knowing, being and doing, um, including respect for the role of ceremony in research, which Wendy's going to discuss later. This seminar will hopefully provide a platform to learn about and discuss Aboriginal cultural governance in research practice. So a bit on Gawadi Gadada, our project. Um, so Gawadi Gadada is funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council under the Medical Research Future Fund. The project was conceived um, from an existing collaboration with Yilaroi, Yuan and Gamaroi traditional cultural knowledge holders. They really wanted to obtain evidence on how existing cultural camps or Walai, what we call them in Yilaroi and Gamaroi language or Dugan in Yuan language, um, impact health and wellbeing and how they could use this evidence to create shared pathways with health services in their respective regions. So the name Gawadi Gadada is a combination of Yilaroi, Gamaroi and Yuan words, and that translates to from the river or fresh water to the ocean or salt water. And it represents the alliance and shared culture between these three nations. Um, and that's also reflected in the studies logo artwork, which Ted will talk about a little bit later. So our project uses a, what we call a place-based cultural governance structure, and that ensures 
cultural knowledge holders are the final decision makers regarding research related activities on their country. And that differs from common forms of governance in Aboriginal research that rely on institutionalised advisory or reference groups. And those sorts of groups may not include cultural knowledge holders or traditional owners. Um, and this reinforces a colonised approach to research, um, which Ted will touch on a little bit later. So as a non-Aboriginal researcher who's worked in this space for close to 10 years, I'd like to share some insights that I've learned along the way. For cultural governance to occur in spaces that are most often dominated by non-Aboriginal researchers and institutions, good allyship is really essential um, for this to occur. So working collaboratively with Aboriginal peoples and in Aboriginal spaces requires being, knowing and doing differently to Western ways of working. If you don't come with an open heart and mind ready to give over power, something that Seth will touch on later, ready to trust the process and ready to work with the utmost respect to country, so the land, the culture and the people, then you may find working in this space challenging. For non-Aboriginal people, this is a journey, or as Wendy will discuss a bit later, a ceremony. It is a process of unlearning and learning new ways of doing things or being with others, a new way of perceiving and knowing the world around us. So when I say new, I mean new for non-Aboriginal people course, Aboriginal people have been being, knowing and doing in this way for more than 60,000 years. So it's about adapting to that. Strengths-based approaches are really important. Uh, this means identifying people's strengths in the team and working in more of a horizontal rather than a, than a vertical or hierarchical way. Um, people are on the team because they bring something to the table. So encouraging horizontal learning among different team members is really important and also recognising people's strengths and allowing team members to step up into their roles based on their strengths. Everyone always has a role to play. Another key um, thing is capacity building. So in research, it's often capacity building is often used to describe the building of technical or academic skills among less experienced team members. Um, but in Aboriginal health research or Aboriginal research, it's capacity building is a two way street. It's not just about non Aboriginal team members building academic or technical skills among Aboriginal team members. It's also about Aboriginal team members building cultural and social skills among non Aboriginal team members. In our work, both are absolutely crucial and essential for the work to be done in a culturally safe way. So equal respect to both of those sets of skills should always be given. Um, trust is everything. So allowing people to fulfill their roles and build trust gradually over time, being patient and open and not rushing the process and being prepared to accept that trust doesn't come easily. And that's rightly so due to ongoing racist and colonial practices in research. Um, however, being humble and being accountable for your responsibilities and actions really helps build trust. Um, reflexivity is another one. So as a non-Aboriginal team member, checking your privilege, your worldview, and sometimes your racism is necessary. So you may not think that what you do or what you say or what you believe is racist, but we live in a racialized society and we may not be aware of how our behavior can be othering, marginalizing, or disrespectful. So reflect often, have conversations with people if you're unsure, do the work, as some people say, um, researching how race operates as a construct and mechanism in society and in workplaces can assist with unlearning potentially racist behaviours or tendencies, as well as being able to identify when it does occur and also to advocate against it when it happens. Um, balance um, is also key. So creating equality within the research team starts with a strong place-based cultural governance group and structure. So too often are Aboriginal reference groups created for research projects that prioritise organisational representation rather than place-based and culturally governed representation. So that's the, the key difference between a reference group and a cultural governance group. Cultural governance leads by cultural protocol, which Ted will talk about soon, and requires traditional cultural knowledge holders, and in some cases elders who hold such knowledge um, to make decisions about the sites that are associated with the research um, and done so with cultural authority. 
So the people that hold this authority may sit on an organisational board or act as the CEO or not. Um, also, older Aboriginal people hold the role of a traditional elder. They don't always hold that role. So an older person and elder, they're two different things. So that shouldn't be assumed. So building a strong foundation with the right people is really crucial. Um, building research teams with equal or majority Aboriginal team members uh, ensures adequate representation and culturally safe working environments. So when teams are too one-sided, the balance of power can be a problem and having a strong cultural governance structure in place can prevent culturally unsafe working environments. Um, lastly, privileging Aboriginal voices and ways of being, knowing and doing. That circles back to what I was saying at the beginning. Um, privileging Aboriginal ways of being, knowing and doing is actually not easy. It requires challenging your own learned and sometimes embedded ways and sometimes requires you to throw certain ways of doing in the bin. Um, and it also requires you to listen and listen deeply. So there's an Aboriginal saying that I'd like to share, you have two ears and one mouth, which means twice the amount of listening over talking. So I will now hand it over to Ted uh, to talk about cultural governance protocols. Mara Barn, thank you. Uh, Yamanda, Yamangindai, Ngaga uh, Ted Fields, Gunya Walgitti, Nga Dinga Gunya, Nga Guni Gunya Dinga. So I'm Ted Fields, um, Walgit D from Walgit. My Dinga, my mate is um, Gunya, the little paddy melon who's now extinct in this part of the world, is my mother. My mother is Gunya. Um, acknowledge each and every one of you who have joined us today for this yarn and um, Sister Wendy there. Um, from the Yuan um, Nation, my lovely partner is Shelley, um, who I won't introduce other than that, she should cover that. Um, the Alma Yilroy, um, Gamilaroi man, we're here in Tamworth on Gamilaroi country, which is more Eastern um, sectional part of the Gamilaroi Nation um, from the um, Western most boundary. I was born in Walgut. North of Walgut, the north of the Bowen River is the Wallaroi um, country and culture. Um, and I'll let Shell introduce herself now. Yeah, I'm in your guide, uh, Shelley Gomorrah, woman from Tamworth, partner to Ted. Um, I'd like to also pay my respects to our elders, past, present, and upcoming those in the future. Yeah, and I'm just going to listen in today um, on some of the work that we've been doing. It's pretty interesting. Okay. So um, the, the cultural governance model, I guess, is how do we get here regarding health, well-being? It's, I mean, you, we all know. We all know that things are um, quite terrible. Now it comes to our mob. My mother passed away at the age I'm at now from complications from... Um, very, very poor health. Her older sister um, passed away at 52. And so we, the, the story goes on and on and on. So while we see quite um, abysmal outcomes in all areas regarding um, Aboriginal representation, um, health, um, I think, is something we all um, ought to be doing a little bit more on. And uh, over... I guess following on from my dad's work, and he, he's a very, very strong and well, well recognized cultural man, um, Ualeroi man, Ualeroi man. Um, he was involved in the very early days with civil rights, um, with activism uh, out in Western New South Wales around Walgut, um, pre and post um, freedom rights. So, he brought with him a very, very strong sense of um, culture as a, um, a guide for the way those new emerging or Aboriginal organisations would, would, um, would operate, that they would have a cultural, culturally governed um, platform um, of protocols and um, guiding principles, I guess, rather than what was being the... the um, 
the models that were handed out by by um, you know the the government and uh, agencies at that time, registrars and, and the like. So we, um, my dad worked for decades in Walgett and around the country and in other places um, on better you know, working towards getting better outcomes for our mob in different areas. Um, worked in education. Um, environment and heritage um, and then he went back to the bush after becoming um, disillusioned by the by the governance structures and the way that our his own people did business in community that it was very white orientated <clears throat> um, and there was very little um, in the way of cultural protocols or, or governance in the way we those old fellows were doing business back then. So he walked away from it, but still taking people out into out into country and culture. Um, and saying, well this is what I this is my role. I want to make sure that our culture and our language um, is accessible to, to whoever wants to come and um, be a part of it, learn. Um, I followed in Dad's footsteps in the late, started in the late 90s, mid late 90s, and again thought we we try and change the outcomes in community. Um, but again, it, it became apparent to me that community was not the place to do this cultural stuff. That we need we needed to be out doing the culture and having people access that culture, and then going back and cultural health, um, being immersed in culturally safe and culturally healthy landscapes, um, culturally intact landscapes, which we're fortunate to have out west. And I know down the south coast, there are some very sacred um, culturally intact um, areas down there. And there are many, many, many um, across the country. Um, but these are these are places where we, we take folks and we work on cultural health. Um, and then we start to share then these um, principles and um, our yarns about cultural governance. Um, and then that leads us into our stories and our, our Burugu, Burugu guy or, or creation stories are our library of law, if you like. That is where all our social and environmental law um, lives. And I say live because we keep we continue to recount and tell these stories, and we tell the little ones. And Shell tells that we tell the little ones here in Tamworth and places we go, and the women in the women's circles, and the men in the men's circles. We're very lucky to have our Gutto George out there as part of this governance group, um, a cultural um, senior leader for our mob out west. Um, 80, he turned eighty-seven on Sunday, and he kept that pretty quiet, but. Um, yeah, so we go out and we recount the stories um, and then we start to unpack the governance within in the stories. Um, and if we had more time, we could we could look at some of those stories or one of those stories, but uh, we're not going to have the time. And as Wendy's gone the other week with Shell, it's probably not the place and the time for that. And as Ari meant, place-based stuff. So yeah, taking the time to come out on the country with mob, with knowledge holders, um, and taking every, stripping down as much as we can to share. So we, we, we'll go down to the United Nation and we'll strip back all of our prejudice on our Yuleroy and Gomeroy culture to, to really immerse ourselves in what the Yuleroy experience is and what they have to teach us about culture and governance down there. Um, so this research um, and the Alliance gave us that uh, such a beautiful opportunity to, to bring knowledge holders from the South Coast and our mob um, out West, the Freshwater Gawadi um, mob together. Um, it was, it's still a process and we're still building on this, this model that we're, 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 um, we're putting together or we're, we're um, it's a, a renewal, I guess, of a, of a way of doing business together um, and business in the sense that women 
looking after women's business, men looking after men's business, and we all look after uh, our, our business culturally. Um, the Alliance um, is an ancient one. Um, the Narren Lakes, where we had our walleye, is a sacred ceremonial gathering um, pilgrimage site in western, northwest New South Wales. There's cultural connection story from Indian Ocean and Kimberley Mob to the Yuan to Gumbangi um, and the coastal mob on the eastern coast. Um, we see the representation in our image. It was um, the, the artwork was provided, the logo was provided by Yuan, um, the Malurai Whalon man. Um, and we talked about the work with him. He's a very busy man. And he had this vision. And the vision was the two mobs. So we see the central figure, which reminds us of a beautiful scarred tree, but also the shape of a canoe um, that we has been very important for the saltwater and freshwater mob. The two central um, features in there, the eyes of the old creator. Um, we have the, the women and men sitting in around the, the water hole. And then the smaller dots all around, the, we said, he said, that's the eyes of our old people from up above watching us and the work we're doing. Always, we always um, hold uh, that to be true, that our old people are always watching us. Uh, we see on the left, the freshwater um, represented there, and on the right, in the waves, we see the salt water, the gutter. Um, and I guess this, for me, was that I understand well enough the governance models that have been delivered to us um, and Aboriginal communities. I mean, we're Aboriginal communities across Australia and certainly um, Aboriginal communities in New South Wales are saturated with, with um, governance, Aboriginal controlled governance models that are, for whatever reason, we're not here to, to, to discuss that, but are, are not delivering the outcomes they would like to, they'd hope to, and certainly um, which is needed by our mob. So to me, it, we, as Dad and others, who, who strong cultural people in the South Coast, uh, you and Mob and other cultural people across the country, they always said you have to go back to your culture. Go back to your culture. You know, try and smarter than any other black bull and do it like a white fella. Go back to your culture. And, and that's, the, that's the place in, in, in which we, um, we take this work. Um, and we're seeing good outcomes at early stage with connections, with people um, getting away from communities and back out on country. So we, we do see that communities um, are, the, are you know, the spaces where a lot of our problems um, live and flourish some, sometimes and um, lots of people are trying to do stuff, but getting mob out on country and working on healing, um, cultural health, um, and cultural health in different, comes out in different ways. Um, through cultural practice, as Ari mentioned earlier, um, the women with cultural practice, ceremony, which Wendy will talk about, all of these elements have been very important for a long time, which is why we still hold story and connection to, these, to our country, to our landscape, um, through our culture. And our, Luckily for a lot of us, uh, our language is um, intact and there's a lot of revival happening in New South Wales. So. Um, next slide, Ari. So where to, um, for us to examine very closely and collectively um, in, this, in this governance group um, and putting the cultural governance framework back together. And we have, for this work to mean anything, it has to be translational back to community, back to community governance structures within communities. So we're not saying, listen, you have to stop what you're doing and you have to start doing it this way. We'll say, well, there's surely as black people, as Aboriginal people, as Yuan, um, Bidjigal, um, Yuluri, Gomeroi, Wildwan, Wiradjuri, surely there's a place 
and space for for your culture to be a part of um, the the processes that um, govern community organisations. Um, so this this is what we firmly believe. This is um, the work that we're set about doing, and um, it's having a framework and a process of engagement um, for our own mob, our leadership, but um, also equally for non-Indigenous allies and leadership to come and see how this how this could work. How 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 would this work in their in their organisation in their um, business, the way they operate, whether it's health, education, um, social housing, uh, justice, um, many, many areas to talk about this. Our, our focus is on health and I've been working on cultural health for quite some time and that is to um, deliver or provide access for as many people as I can to healthy cultural landscapes, healthy cultural practices, um, story, language, um, and connection. Um, we see the image there. This was from our walleye in April. Um, so when we're at walleye out camp, out bush, always get up um, before the first light and I always look to the east um, to Mayangale, um, which is um, Venus, uh, the morning star because it's a very, very, every time I look at it, I'm reminded of the story. Um, and then there was this weird thing I witnessed there it was, there were three other stars in alignment with it. Um, and then I, I started second guessing, have I seen this before? This is weird. And I said, went up to the women's camp and I said, Shell, there's something weird in the sky. So I'm yelling out, he got some mates with him. So this, for the entirety of that week, we, we saw this and others who uh, got up to witness the, the sunrise, um, witnessed this alignment. And then we come back to, to the town and back to Signal and we find out that this is, um, is an alignment of Saturn, Mars, Venus and Jupiter, which happens once every thousand years. So uh, at that particular walleye, we had Ewan Mob come back, Black Duck people, and ceremony and dance out there and song um, and sharing culture for a week, week long with our mob, Bumroy Yulroy mob. Um, and then to, to know that they, those, their ancestors would have been there a thousand years ago to witness the previous alignment of those brothers, those sisters, the male, the female manifestation in our culture. Um, and when Wendy talks a bit a bit more about ceremony. So we are very strong believers that coincidence is a very rare thing, um, especially with connections and alignments and, and partners. So uh, is there another slide, Ari? Last slide. Last one. Oh, that's it. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to to um, Sister Wendy, and I'll hope if there's any questions later on. Sorry about Ted. Hand over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Ted. Um, thank you to everyone for your, your time today to listen to us and see our pictures of country that we put up. Um, I'm a Ewan um, Verapai woman um, from the far south coast and also the shark people from north of Taree. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge I'm actually up in Queensland at the moment on the shores of Moreton Bay. I want to acknowledge the Kondamooka peoples as the traditional owners of this place, the unceded owners, and to thank them and the old people for providing this wonderful place for me to be. Um, I'll try and move through quickly so we don't we still have time for questions so you'll probably notice that you I'll just go back to that one quickly Ari sorry the photo there is um, a photo of Gulliga mountain and if you'll see at the top there's a circular rainbow above it that rainbow appeared this is taken after the those awful bushfires 
and the Yom peoples did a ceremony, rain ceremony, to bring the rains to put all the fires out. And um, those rains came, and after the rains, this rainbow formed. So for us, you can see how powerful our belief is in ceremony. Um, and my comments from my brother there when he looked up and he said, ha ha, the ancestors are happy. And I think that brings us to, um, that if you go to the next slide, to what I wanted to talk about today, about the role of ceremony in research and research as ceremony in itself. So my journey on this actually started um, over 22 years ago, <laughs> one day when I was over in Perth and I heard Brother Kumul J. Errol West talk about his doctorate, which was the work of the Japananka paradigm. And it was the first time I'd heard research spoken about in a way that it could be different from a different viewpoint. We could include our viewpoints. And he called on researchers that day. You know, he gave us a, a responsibility, take this out, do it, bring it into being break the myth that there is one research paradigm. And it was then where I realised that there was a space for ceremony and for spiritual and cultural domains within research. So, in the, in the next major, I suppose, development in the literature, and people are probably familiar with, with Sean Wilson's work on research as ceremony that he published in 2008. And, um, the key thing in that is about um, acknowledging the relational accountability and a re relational viewpoint rather than a separatist viewpoint. And Sean Wilson's quote at the end there, the research that we do as Indigenous peoples is a ceremony that allows us a raised level of consciousness and insight into our world. And that was particularly what I wanted to be able to do so that my PhD research and research would help continue and build my cultural connections and allow me a space to be um, someone with cultural and spiritual views. Next one, thanks, Sister Ari. So where this relates to research, and I'm very much an applied researcher, so this doesn't stand outside of research practice. This is about ontology, and, and Ari mentioned that in her first slides, being critical reflect, um, critically reflective of the worldviews, the way we've been raised, our culture, our education system. So research as ceremony actually sits in an ontological position in the research. Next one. So I went back and I revisited the research handbooks to look about a normal research paradigm, which describes four main elements, an ontological framework, uh, an epistemological framework, a methodological framework, and an axiology framework, the values and, and ethics. But I want to just focus on ontology because this is not discussed by researchers. And we all have worldviews. We all have positions where we've been educated in how we see the world. So research textbooks tell us that a researcher's assumptions impact the topic that we look at, how we design questions and how we actually do research. This is all researchers. So this is relevant for all of us and to have a think about it in our own, from our own positions. The so next one, I'm doing well, I'm clicking through. And again, I'm just referring to here how, how ontology is described in research, um, research textbooks, particularly qualitative research. So we're talking about a branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. This form the ontological arguments within research. Ontology also shows the relations between concepts and categories in a subject area or domain. And from that, we can actually build an ontological database, which is how the concepts are connected and not separated out, which tends to be normal research practice from my observation. Next one, please. This is the one I'll spend a bit more, more time on. What does, ceremony, what does the ceremony ontology mean in its application to research, design and practice? Ted has spoken about different ways about ceremony. 
Ceremony is an act. We enter into a ceremony. We voluntarily decide to do it. And from my own um, experiences and teaching of Aboriginal ceremony from the South Coast, once one enters into that, one's in um, a very respectful space. And the difference is that, that before research happens, there's a process of what we call cultural grounding. And Ted and Ari have spoken about place, that knowledge is grounded in place, that behaviours and rules all come from place. And our relationship to place is the key thing. And that is what has been really damaged from colonisation. It's a deliberate strategy of war. It's how you, it's how you genocide. It's the first part of genociding a people. And this is what we're regenerating. We're rebuilding that. We're resisting the separation of us from place. And by bringing ceremony as a, a as a process of, of how a researcher behaves in research. Um, this is our work in built bringing this back. So a cultural grounding is that place is central to knowledge. And most importantly, that we're operating in a living law. It's not history, it's not something from the past. We don't say, oh, it used to be, we used to do that. We used to have this. And that's why it's very hard, the stories, need to be oral, they need to be told in a place and at the right time. So reading a cultural story or, or cultural knowledge from a book misses and excludes the living aspect out of it. So there's so much knowledge then is not in the written word. And also ceremony, a research operating under ceremony is that when we do ceremony and the harder the ceremony it is, the more it is an offering for others. It is not for ourselves. And that's a real break on, on the ego, dampens the ego down and also makes you look critically at what are the real benefits of this research? Who's benefiting out of it? Is there a reciprocal exchange of benefit? And reminder, and we always say that in our acknowledgements, you know, for, for those that are yet to come, the elders that are with us now and those that are yet to come, and our young people are so important and all our work is about getting things right so that they can come into a learning space that isn't corrupted by these traumas of colonisation and separating us from our mother country. Cultural brand means that I acknowledge that I'm a physical, intellectual, cultural and spiritual being in all ways. And again, it's a check on the ego, I think, in this. Um, and with ontology, it brings back those realities of culture and spiritual beliefs as part of how humans see the world. And again, that's often left out completely in how researchers describe how they undertake their research, um, the limitations that it might have or the expansions, and I urge all researchers in this to really see themselves as physical, intellectual, cultural and spiritual beings and all the people that they're working with or a phenomena that they're researching to include it. Cultural grounding means that I'm not separate from this experience. I'm part of it. So again, I don't objectively view research as something separate to my own being. Cultural grounding allows for the metaphoric learnings from the natural world. And anyone that's worked with me will know that I'm always full of these stories. I talk about the orb spider as a metaphor for Aboriginal representation and engagement. I talk about Junga, the octopus, as a community development. We all have these stories that have multiple levels of knowledge. And they're learning because they're a problem solving way of teaching. They don't lay it all out on a plate for you. You go away and you think, you observe, you listen. And another the key act of cultural grounding is respect. Again, it's the ego check, the status check. And that respect is enacted through pro cultural protocols 
the laws, disciplines, rules of behavior. But the key thing is that all our work is for others. It's about how caring for others and that how our work is actually helping with that. So ceremony and research is about relatedness. And this is where ontology as well. Um, research is a system. It's not separate layers. They're not separate entities. Each impacts on the other. Relationships are reality and reality is relationships. The key relationship we're taught of and we're reminded of in a ceremony approach to research is our relationship to place. And I started that with you can with that picture, and that's my relationship to place, that powerful picture of, of the rainbow, the cultural landscapes, what are the teachings from place, what are the stories, and what do they teach us in terms to how we then apply to a to the current situations that we're in today, applying really old knowledge, the oldest surviving knowledge on the planet to 2022. I keep thinking it's 23, but I'm jumping the gun. I tend to do that. <laughs> the other important, important thing about ceremony and research is authority. So I also say I am under cultural authority, meaning that I am accountable to my cultural elders, to the teachers and to the place of Yuan and the particular Yuan country on the far south coast. They keep me in check. And in this model, we have this amazing um, knowledge of both the freshwater and salt water in the governance group, which provides an even richer and, and deeper learning for me about this, where I'm still learning um, about applying these rules in ceremony of respect, of offering for others, of viewing each person as a multifaceted human being. Um, I think Suzanne for you, mate. I thought that. <laughs> that's right. This is the key thing that's different. And it's I think this is for all of us. We can learn from this because we all have this background of being these multifaceted beings. The next slide, thanks. I'm rushing through it, but um, we'll have some more time for questions at the end, which is important. So this final slide is this is this is my cultural governance. This is my cultural authority. This is Gulaga. This is my mother. This is the mountain down at the south coast where we have a lot of ceremonies and our teaching sites. And just seeing the mountain is a ceremonial experience for us. This sustains me, she inspires me. She reminds me what my work is about and she gives me hope. And I think hope is such an important thing. We can't give up, we can't let all the work that's been done by those that have gone before us mean nothing. And um, Gulaga, together with the strength that I get from the freshwater peoples, and understanding the different ways from such different country, different medicines has just been a very astounding and wonderful experience for me. So we always, down the South Coast, we're always taught to end everything that we say through an acknowledgement and we say through the mother, Vainana Gulaga, and everything I've just said, I wash it through her and to keep me clean in my spirit my body and my mind and my thoughts so thank you all and <laughs> sorry to rush it through but i hope we can have a yarn about it more later so i'd like to hand over to my colleague and um sister as well from another mother from another mister <laughs> um steph who's going to actually talk a little bit more about aspects of power and control in research so thank you. Thanks, Ari. Maribel, Wendy. And I'll, over to you, Steph. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Ted and Shelley and Ari. Um, hi, everyone. I am based up in Queensland as well, although 
uh, permanently. I'm in council and I'd like to recognise the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which I live and work, the Bindal and Wulgarukaba peoples, and acknowledge their elders past and present. I'd also like to extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present today. Um, so a common theme that's really run through the discussion so far in Ari and Ted and, and Wendy's reflections is this importance of respect and trust and collaboration and the central role that these play in the conduct of ethical and impactful research. Um, but I think that we would all recognise that in any setting and in the research process, um, including the relationships and the collaborations that constitute the research process, these are contested spaces and there are often huge differences, differentials in power among the different actors. Um, next slide, Ari. Um, now, in part, and Wendy spoke to this really elegantly in her discussion of ontology, those power differences can be traced to the contested and power-laden nat nature of evidence itself. What we consider to be valid knowledge or real evidence really has huge implications for the relationships and the collaborations in research, including from whom and under what conditions funding is made available, who is considered expert uh, and competent to lead the research process, how the research itself is conducted. Um, and in the health space, and broadly speaking, um, we know that research systems have historically, and I would say still to present, they reward in professional status and resourcing and reputation, more positivist approaches over humanistic, relativistic or interpretative ones. They reward biomedical over other forms of knowledge and they reward white voices over all others. So as non-Indigenous researchers, and this is the space from which I speak and, and reflect on those issues, if we are truly going to engage in collaborative Aboriginal research, we have to be able and willing to actively consider our own role and expertise or lack thereof in this space. Um, we may, courtesy of the political economy of research and academia, we may hold significant organisational power, significant resourcing power, but we have to question whether our experience or our knowledge base or our lived experience is necessarily the best basis for having input or influencing the choice of research question, the theories, the methodologies, the analyses. And increasingly, we're recognizing that many forms of power and privilege that non-Indigenous researchers bring to their work actually distance them and render them less competent to examine certain issues. Next slide, thanks, Harry. So reflexivity something that Ari mentioned way back at the beginning of this presentation. Reflexivity in research has, I think, probably up until relatively recently, the last several decades maybe, been really the domain of anthropologists. But it's increasingly recognised as both a capability and a tool that's critical to any research work or endeavour that is acknowledging the contingent nature of knowledge production. But the question is, how do we get better at it. You know, uh, non-Indigenous researchers are not necessarily required or incentivized to be reflexive. How do we become good allies, as Ari termed it? How do we train up and coming members of our team to practice it? And how do we build it into funding and research design processes in ways that actually structure our own decisions about how we do research? Uh, and on your screen, um, I've drawn on a paper that I co-authored with a really wonderful group of colleagues last year. It was a labor of love that outlined, amongst other things, a series of questions that can be used to guide researchers or their team's reflections on the way relationships of power within your own research project um, is shaping that project. And I should reflect that these questions and sort of these reflections are non-exclusive. There are plenty of other uh, resources out there that will encourage you to ask similar questions. So this is just, just one example. 
but there's you know examples of these sorts of questions uh, for a non-indigenous researcher to consider if they're engaging in the Aboriginal research space. For what purpose is this research being conducted? And in what role can I best serve that purpose? Would others agree with my assessment? Do I consider myself an expert? And if so, why? What forms of knowledge and expertise do I not have that would be critical to the integrity of this research? On whose knowledge and experience will I be dependent in relation to ensuring the integrity of the research design or the implementation or analysis? And finally, and this speaks to sort of the broader theme of this whole webinar, what mechanisms are in place to ensure those who have the knowledge and experience on which the integrity of the research depends have voice and authority to guide that research process. So a, con a, um, a conscious nurturing of critical reflexivity at all stages of the research process is really a, a necessary component, I would say, of ethical and rigorous practice. practice. However, you know, I would note that maintaining awareness of those power relationships that structure our work is not easy. Um, these questions and processes really demand a very deliberative bottom up and ultimately more time consuming approach. Um, and Wendy gave a really beautiful example just now of what that process might look like with her description of research as ceremony grounded in, in place. Unfortunately, however, we know that there are also many incentives that work against this type of practice that undermine inclusive, transparent approaches, tight timelines, limited budgets, pressures to publish, pressures to publish in certain types of journals, the hierarchies and power, knowledge um, and, and knowledge that, that privilege certain types of individuals. So it requires, this is what Ari was working to, uh, re referencing when she said, we have to do the work. It's this work. Um, but it is a path towards research that is transformative, both in process, because it inverts the power relationships that shape the actual research focus, and because of the outcome, the, the knowledge that is produced uh, has the potential to be transformative, because it will point to things, ways of thinking, being and doing that we've not considered before. That's all from me. Thanks. Maribel, Steph, thank you. All right, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions. We hope to have more, but please raise your hand if you have a question. I'll just jump in. Suzanne gave us a clap. Thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> jump in, Wendy. Um, my curiosity is, um, Having spent some time with uh, a group up north where we had problems with elders knowing different things and then when the researchers came and spoke to only certain people but didn't speak to everyone, the stories weren't complete, there was lots of contesting afterwards when things were published and then the community got really upset and there was a whole lot of po political stuff going on. How do you get around that? So it's not one or two voices who know it all, basically, but the researchers hadn't spoken to all voices. <laughs> I think I think you really said it there. You know, the researchers didn't take, talk to all the voices. So there's also a reality that we can't, and I think researchers need to really honestly acknowledge their limitations. Um, and, and also, I think... This is something we talk about a lot in terms of understanding the effects of colonisation and that there is no such thing as the Aboriginal community or the elders. There's a whole lot of levels. There's people who are born in that place, people who were born in somewhere else, have cultural connections to somewhere else, move. We have all those variables and that's the reality of colonisation and um, what we're trying to come back from. And I think researchers can cause a lot of damage by picking who is a knowledgeable voice. And we do need to be able to change 
the methods in how we consult and how we engage different Aboriginal peoples. And the voices that we're trying to bring out now is really on researchers, keep asking your questions and going back to the traditional knowledge holders, if there are knowledge holders, mm -hmm. um, and not pe put, pe putting people from differing positions in the same room so they have to compete for their level of identity. Yeah. And that's the most harmful, horrible thing that happens, and it happens all the time. And it's a failure to acknowledge the realities of what colonisation has done and that you have all different sorts of Aboriginal groups. You have elders who are older Aboriginal people. You know, I'm an older Aboriginal woman at the moment. I'm living up in Queensland, but I'm not an elder from this place. But someone else could see me as that and could put me up as that. And I think, oh, well, that's a bit of status I've never had in my life. So research can create and cause problems with status and identity. And I think we need to really change the way you look at community. Frances Peters Little, who paper called The Community Game, is a great article I think everyone should read, where it really explains a lot of that. Gatekeepers. Governments are the worst ones in causing this. Okay, I just we just need to talk to someone that's easy to talk to. Okay, this group is there. We can get in contact with them. They'll be the ones. And when researchers do that and set up a certain group as their knowledge holders, that's just totally bad practice. Hmm. Thank you. Ted, did you want to um, speak on that? Yeah, I, I won't, I won't um, have too much more to add to that um, and just conscious of the time. Um, <clears throat> New South Wales is, is quite a um, special set of circumstances um, in the context of um, Aboriginal Australia or Indigenous Australia. So, and particularly around this um, community governance um, business, we've been just trip we've been on for the last five decades um, so <clears throat> it's a great question um and and it is it, it's it's something we we uh we deal with and i guess the way i i deal with it out um Susan out west is i with Shelley here we go out and light the fire and, and it's open invitation we invite people who may have some knowledge um some who have lots of knowledge or some who uh, people in their 70s who went to school with my mother who, who left Walgood in the 60s as teenagers and they say they claim to have no cultural knowledge and put me forward as a cult, their cultural advisor. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, just there, there's lots of um, levels of um, status within the community, which is why I tend to like working out on country. Sorry about that. Margaret, you had a question? Yeah, um, it started with Wendy and it keeps going um, and and with Ted. Um, the whole issue of, um, because I'm, I'm chair of a neighbourhood centres in New South Wales and, and we're very much into local place-based and the knowledge is in that community and they should be the determinants of their own um, futures and outcomes. Outcomes, sorry, horrible word. Um, but I started thinking about doing research in particularly urban areas with Aboriginal communities. And um, I really, this is probably a cup of tea and sitting around that fire circle, Uncle <laughs> Ted, um, conversation because often we um, identity has been lost because of colonisation or stolen generations. And it's really made me start thinking then um, our organisation has had success um, and a real respect from uh, working with an Aboriginal organisation. But I wouldn't presume that I'm always going to have that because I've got different people, different times and things like that. But it's actually made me start asking lots of questions around um, who are the people to speak to in regional, in urban areas and things like that. So maybe that's another conversation for another time. But um, I'm just asking a, a question that possibly um, is as long as a piece of string. Thank you. It is long as a piece of string, but there are segments to it, I think, you know. And again, it's not, not seeing that there is only one voice to give. There's a whole lot of different groups within a community. 
There's elderly Aboriginal people who are displaced from their original countries. There's Aboriginal people with disabilities. There's Aboriginal sex different, you know, orientations. And we can't just assume, you know, that there's this one thing. And we need to allow space for different, for different voices to come out. And our work in one of Ari's slides, privileging Aboriginal voice. And I was always taught a key question to, to ask every time we do this and we look at it, we say, who isn't here? What we've got here is voices from this particular group that represents their views on this day, the people that were here, and don't then carry it over. This is a view of the Aboriginal people from the whole of Southeast Queensland or from the whole South Coast. No, it's not. It's the view of Aboriginal people who are members of land councils, or it's a view of native title owners. And it's starting us to research to, to gather different Aboriginal viewpoints not call them the one Aboriginal viewpoint and acknowledge that in what we write as our limitations. This is what we got from this particular group. It does not apply to all these others. These people should be, for more knowledge, we should talk to these as well. We can't do everything, but we can as researchers acknowledge what our, how limited our knowledge is. Oh, Wendy, I always say that it's the answer that you're looking at all the time at that particular moment in time. And I totally agree with you because I do always ask around things is that it's the people that aren't there that you really want to speak with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You keep asking that question. Who else can I talk to? Who isn't here? And often the, the people that are harder to get to are the ones that are closer to the heart of it. They're on the front line. They're the grassroots. They're at the... They're on the, the line of the fire, so to speak, and they'll be further away from us in a privileged position of, of trying to gather viewpoints. Mm. And I guess, Margaret, what, is it, what, what we hope for in this New South Wales context and, and, and elsewhere is that um, moving, moving forward with this work that mobs um, in places and spaces where you work would be able to sit and talk with us and um, hopefully we'll be able to help them because our, the governance stories and protocols um, and the way it's all set up from my knowledge of it is that we can, we, it's set up to remove the individual, remove the ego, and we don't talk about a lot of it. this stuff was designed specifically to remove the people out of it. So we we look at the myths and the legends, if you like, the way the colonised people viewed our law. Um, but they were very, very they're, they're the smartest social scientists the world of the planet would ever know. That we can tell stories now that science has told us 35, 40 thousand years old. We tell the same story. We talk about Gutia. Gutia has been extinct in New South Wales, Western New South Wales. They've moved so far north that they're salt and freshwater crocodiles now. Um, so we we go way back with story, and that that thing amazes me. But that in that we have the Mangi story out at Narran Lake, which is a fresh saltwater pippy. So this is about <coughs> mob not from Narran Lakes. Narran Lakes is more than 600 kilometres west of the Pacific Ocean, but we have the connection and the resources that were brought by the seagull to our mob, to the crow, Galwan, is still there today. So it's still a, a natural resource shared by a mob who brought knowledge to our mob, and we take that across to another mob. So we shared these stories about sharing knowledge, about sharing resources, about interaction, about relationships. And then we, then the old seagull, he left. He left, he left that resource. They leave the knowledge, they leave the skill sets, like um, Ari was talking about earlier. Um, so we have really old stories about that. And we had a recent experience um, in June where we had a senior male, we had some stolen generation people on country, 84, oldest 64 youngest and these men have never the opportunity for them to camp with their family fathers uncles was robbed of them 
in the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this is the first time these men have been out to camp, and they'd like when they when they're interacting, they're like young boys because it's something they've been looking for. And for us, Shelley and I, and to to provide that ex, that experience for them, that opportunity is a blessing for us. And but certainly the the one of the um, purposes of this is that we can share our law, our story with others where it's it may be missing or elements of it missing, and we can hopefully with their you know request at their request come and help them work through this. I'm just gonna, oh sorry. Go I was there. just gonna pass it back to you, Elizabeth, because we are out of time, I think. Yes, thank you. I'm just conscious that the time is up and people we're losing some people. And before everyone disappears, I just want to take the opportunity. Sorry, I can't figure out how to get the screen share off um, or I'd show my face. Um, just take the opportunity to thank you all very much. I think we heard some uh, fantastic perspectives, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal perspectives about Aboriginal governance. And um, I know I've learned a lot and have some questions for some of you I may be following up with. Uh, so thank you again for for to the presenters and also everyone else for um, joining today. And I'm sure that the presenters would happy to uh, take any further questions or have the discussion uh, separately if, if anyone else would like to continue the conversation. <laughs>